and welcome. My name is Shingai Manjewa and I'm coming to you from Toronto in Canada. I lead professional development at the Victor Institute and I'm going to be your moderator today. I'd like to start by celebrating the rich culture of Indigenous communities across Canada, where we're joining you from today. And uh, the land that we're on is um, covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. So we're all pleased to be here, and we're excited that you'll be joining us for this wonderful event. I'm going to introduce you uh, first to Annie from uh, PwC. I'll ask Annie to say a few words uh, about herself. Uh, Annie, please introduce yourself. Thank you. So I, I'm Annie Veillet. I'm a partner in our analytics practice at PwC. I'm actually based out of Montreal, uh, but uh, typically I spend a couple of days a week in, in Toronto or, or out west. So we do have a, a national team and, and get to work with uh, a variety of organizations across the country. So always exciting uh, to, to be with an audience like this. That's from a little bit everywhere in Canada. I have a background in analytics. I grew up using data, I think trying to drive value from data, et cetera. But for the past uh, three years, approximately, I've been really focusing on understanding how AI is being used in organizations, the application of responsible AI, had the opportunity to work with uh, some of my colleagues from across the globe on uh, shaping a toolkit that addresses and helps manages all the risks that come with the, the, the usage of AI. So um, we'll, we'll hopefully touch on some of those uh, ideas and how what we're seeing in the market today. So thanks Fantastic. For Fantastic. Thank you, Annie. Really great to have you today. Ron, you're up next. Pleasure to be here. So I'm a VP of AI Engineering and CIO at the Vector Institute and engineering lead at the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. Um, have been working in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence for the past 15 years. Um, I've been a longtime uh, technology optimist and continue to believe that artificial intelligence has tremendous potential for the future, um, but also believe it's incredibly important that with this power we we think responsibly and wisely. Um, so I was excited to, uh, to go from my previous role at Google in the CTO office to come to Vector with the idea of being part of an organization that's got a long-term charter and focus around beneficial AI and a, a mission to really think about how we can make sure that it lands in a responsible way, whether it be uh, in beneficial commercial applications and health applications or indeed informing uh, our policy uh, so that we uh, advance our democratic values and, and priorities in the country. So super excited for the discussion today. Thanks, Ron. So those are our guest speakers today. We are going to be talking about responsible artificial intelligence. And to kick it off, I think it's wise to just define this topic. So Annie, what are we talking about? So we've said we've called a responsible AI. What is it? Yeah, thanks. So, so even take a, even one baby step back, it, just to level set even on what AI is. So really we're looking at machines that can sense, so get some data through videos, through direct data sources, through voice, et cetera, uh, that can think uh, using this data. So we'll, we'll, that's where we're applying the math and the algorithms. And then that can take some actions from that thinking. So the machines that do all of this with the human in the loop at variation of degrees. So some of our machines are working really hand in hand with humans, uh, where they're preparing some information potentially for them, they're taking some actions, uh, but they uh, have that guardrail of the human in an organization before something actually comes out as an action. There are other situations, if we're thinking even about like the self-driving cars, where a machine is meant to really act, sense, think, and act on its own. And that's where uh, the level of risk will, will slowly go up between the human a lot in the loop or the human very little bit in the loop. And um, the risks going up really means that there are a number of guardrails that you still need to put in place as an organization as a, a group of humans using and, and collaborating with this tool. So responsible AI is making sure that these machines stay in those guardrails of what they were meant to do, that they're acting 
ethically, that they're fair, that they're doing all the right things and performing the way that the humans were, were meaning for the machine to, to work. So hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Uh, level set on what, why, why are we talking about uh, responsible AI and what AI really means for us? I might Fantastic. just add Ron? to that. Yeah. yeah, I might just add that, uh, you know, and it, I, I think we're, we're seeing, we've seen in the last few years is uh, machine learning techniques have advanced so rapidly in the last few years. You know, it's certainly a reason why the Vector Institute was created was because of all the advances that uh, Canadian AI had achieved, you know, with deep learning, right, that it was creating all kinds of great new commercial applications, but uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So, uh, you know, I think it's incredibly important that organizations be responsible for the impact of their use of technology. And, you know, some, in a best case, that means anticipating risks and mitigating them. But, you know, I think it's important to have responsibility even for unanticipated consequences, right? I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, as an example of where uh, organizations have uh, had challenges, I mean, Certainly unfair bias, as Annie talked about, is important, but so is, you know, think about what appeared uh, to be relatively low stakes. Uh, how do you optimize clicks uh, for serving media, right? That, that seems like a relatively low stakes application, but it turns out at scale, as you start to change information flows in society, um, the algorithms that were predicting clicks in, in large media platforms have had incredible impact. And of course, we've subsequently seen efforts around what's also responsibility around combating misinformation or polarization or, or addiction, right? So even, even things that seemed benign and certainly were not intended to behave a certain way had meaningful consequences, right? So I think as organizations, we have to do better in terms of thinking ahead about what are the risks and how do we not only one time up front look at what might go wrong, but how do we monitor for things that we didn't expect to, to mitigate when things start to go awry as we deploy these new technologies. So I, I like the way we started because that sort of leads into the meat of this is why I'm just going to say it. Why should we care? Because I understand it's nice that we should be responsible, but does it really contribute to the bottom line? Why is it important for business leaders to understand responsible AI? Clearly, um, you know, with risk can come some consequences as well. I'm sure we've all seen in the media some stories of um, AI going wrong. <laughs> so uh, certainly you don't want as an organization to have um you know, lost control to a certain extent of what the the designed and the machine was meant to do. As I mentioned before, if it's not guardrailed, if it goes out and acts in what we can consider a rogue manner, uh, it has consequences not only on the public and that organizes customers, but also on the reputation. So that's certainly one reason to care. Um, in general, though, there is going to be, I think, more and more uh, pressure and demand for that, that again, fairness and, and accountability to the organizations that start using the technology. So Ram touched on it, but accountability for a machine is a complicated thing. And I don't think it's a straight answer of who's responsible. I'm just going to go out there and say, it's not the data scientists that built the machine. <laughs> so if, if we think that um, the responsibility of, of the actions of a machine is all meant to be uh, in the hands of the, um, the team that's basically training that machine, I think we're, we're not looking at it um, in the right way. So as an organization, why should you care? Because there are a number of things that you need to take into consideration and accountability ultimately is much broader than the development team. Ron? I would, yeah, I would, I would uh, just let, let, let me address that question of accountability. What I see so often happen, and I'll get back to you know, motivations for, for responsible AI. Uh, what I see often happening is the strategy that, that nobody feels like they're in a position to, to understand and address the risks, right? So yes, the, the data scientists, the engineers, the development teams feel like they're, they're executing a business objective, they've been told, and they're optimizing according to the directions they have. And then all too often, you see business leaders taking a perspective that they don't really understand what's going on with AI, and, and they don't feel like they know how to influence 
uh, the outcomes or, or give concrete direction. So it, it, it becomes the, the worst case scenario that's all too common is you have basically no one at the wheel of this car that's zooming ahead on the road, right? And, and so uh, I think, you know, a key antidote to that is uh, organization collectively has to be responsible and, and needs to have the communication pathways between the experts uh, in different domains. But, but without getting into all the, the ideas of how to address it, I'll, I'll go back to, I think, I think and it's totally right in terms of reputational risk is a big motivator for companies. I, I think increasingly we're seeing companies and organizations taking a multi-stakeholder model and looking at not only their duties to shareholders, but to other stakeholders, their customers, their employees, right? And increasingly customers, employees are also very much responding, right? When they, when they, when they see how an organization acts, uh, you know, if, if there are missteps, if there's a cavalier attitude, it can be very costly, right? And, and I think there's a meaningful question around, you know, what is the liability and what will be, uh, you know, regulatory response, right? So another reason I think a lot of organizations are, are moving in this area is to um, get ahead of uh, sort of mandated rules uh, that might might be less uh, contextual. You know, usually when when things get to a point where regulation lands, it's it's uh, quick and decisive, and there's little room to adjust. So the more an organization can adopt good practices and self regulate, they get get out ahead and demonstrate what can be done, and be part of the conversation for inevitable regulation as it happens. Yeah, so Ron, you've touched on um, a nerve, really, which is that push and pull between where industry wants to advance and accelerate in AI, but the regulation might be pulling us back, or even just the risk might be pulling us back. What do you see, Ron, as that balance between we want to advance and taking COVID as an example, right? We needed the technology to advance very quickly. What is the right balance? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that... Yeah, it, it's incredibly important in, in this field. You de definitely want to have uh, an approach of how do you deploy uh, controls that sort of tied to the risk. Um, and I think it's, it's an area where we as a society need to get a lot better in terms of how do we regulate new technologies, right? One of the things that I'm excited about, you know, Schwartz Reisman, um, you know, our, our leader, Jillian Hadfield has been a big advocate in how do you integrate more private sector mechanisms into regulating new technologies, right? So ways of doing certification and audit so that you can have standards set by government, you know, even by private uh, industry or association, but then have real competition and innovation among third parties who can help certify and guarantee, uh, you know, compliance, right? So you lower the overhead, um, you know, and in my mind, what ties into that again is like an ongoing process that the way you, that, that this is a space where we as a society and, and as companies are learning. So, getting started, but continue to monitor and adapt based on what we see as, as emerging as challenges is important, right? So I think, I think those are important directions, right? I think organizationally, um, the, the good news is there's a lot of research, you know, take the field of fairness in machine learning where, uh, you know, researchers at, at Vector have published some seminal work, you know, folks like, uh, Rich Semmel and Tony Patassi and students of theirs, right? Talking about what are ways that you can really quantify unfair bias and, and means of mitigating that, you know, training models, representations that uh, can provably, it's impossible to reconstruct protected attributes. So there's a lot of advances, whether it be in, in fairness or privacy, um, quality, robustness in the research community, um, but it's still, it, it's a fast moving field, right? So it's also important that, uh, businesses track that. Uh, but I do think that the number one thing is um, getting started and building organizational capacity and starting with, you know, if you're going to start something, start in an area where there's the highest risk, right? And, and say, like, what are the things we're doing where we most need to focus? And Annie, PwC does just that. You help organizations build that type of capacity. What have you seen uh, with your clients? 
Yeah, so what we're seeing, um, and Ron started touching on it, is that there's definitely some elements of control and trying to have some standards when it comes to um, I'll go about that that team that's developing the machine, right? Like, so we understand more and more the risks for biases, and we know how to test for it uh, when when we have a set of of data that's selected to train a model. There's definitely some techniques that we're starting to see appearing in that um, cycle of controls at the development stage. We can then, you know, basically, I wouldn't say um, necessarily guarantee, but prove that there has been some controls along the way and that we're happy with the results. Where we're seeing a lot of gaps is that, um, you know, that's just the development team that's getting involved in controlling how that machine's developed and it's going to be acting. There are gaps to, tying that back to things like an organization's strategy. So are we sure that this machine is acting and behaving according to this organization's strategy? Is it following the, the rules and regulations and the, you know, of again, that organization? So there may be some things that are very important, but that the checks are not necessarily done and tied back to the machine that's being built and why it's being built. And I would say the the far end of that governance and controls that we'd like to see when we're working with organizations is also the maintenance. So once a machine is used and working hand in hand with, with uh, their employees or their customers, how are we controlling and how are we checking that it hasn't drifted, that it's still doing what it's meant to be doing, and even rechecking the context. Is a machine that was designed today uh, in the context of what we're living today um, going to be appropriately reacting in three years or in six months even, we don't know. So checking again on those machines that have been tested, deployed, everybody's given their, their thumbs up, but do we have mechanisms in place to control that it's still behaving the way we want it to behave? So um, so some progress, <laughs> but but still lots of room to add those guardrails to make sure that we're, we're staying safe um, and that we're uh, using this technology as really an enhancer for an organization and not as a, as a taking a very large risk of what could happen uh, because we brought in that technology. So. I, I might add, Annie, to your point around uh, sort of ongoing maintenance, I think the importance of a broad set of metrics and looking at the impact of the system on many things, you know, especially because we typically optimize our machine learning systems for a very specific proxy objective that we hope will, uh, will sort of translate into real world impact. But this idea of Goodhart's law that when you optimize something, you tend to create unexpected uh, extremes elsewhere and create negative consequences, means that, that the guardrails are watching, what are the other effects of this system? How are people responding to this new system? And how what's happening in the broader ecosystem, right? So it's like, it's not enough just to say, hey, we've improved click rate, for example. Like what's happening to time spent or churn, right? You know, are there impacts and subgroups that we need to be watching, right? These are all things that a good manage, monitoring, excuse me, program post-release need to watch closely and get ahead of any possible issues. One of the things that I love about what you said is around that this isn't, you know, a, an airy fairy concept. There are statistical methods and engineering methods that we can put in place to actually um, uh, help us in the fairness process. Can you talk to some use cases that you might have seen, Annie? Absolutely. So when it comes to to fairness, and um, you know, before I get into concrete examples I've seen in Canada, one, one thing that brings to mind um, of what's fair is really context, right? I, I think a lot of people have seen, uh, you can take some, some uh, as they're working on the self-driving cars, there are some questionnaires out there to test how people, how humans would behave in certain situations. And there's digital to ask questions like, the the um, the brakes on the car are no longer functioning, and in front of you there is an elderly person, and uh, a little bit further behind are two children. You will definitely have to hit one. Which one would you hit? And well, they found that in certain parts of the world, 
the tendency will be to protect the elderly, while in other parts of the world, the tendency will be to protect the young. So again, that's just to give a, a high level example of context is super important. And that's why I keep saying tying back what the machine um, is doing for a given organization, we need to understand what is fair and feels right for the context of that organization is very important. So specifically, some of the cases we've seen are uh, around, you know, approvals and declines of loans, right? Like that's a big one where we've had uh, a lot of um, situations and, and some of them are, are in the, uh, the, the news where it was understood that certain parts or certain demographics uh, would be declined more often than not. And women specifically were being declined more often than not with exact uh, match on the financial situation of the person. So there is definitely some cases where it was not fair, especially in what we consider fair in our society in Canada. So there's uh, these needed to be understood, addressed and um, revisit how the model was trained and try to understand again, why, why is it that these decisions were made? And that brings back to another component we didn't touch on yet, but it's around explainability. So when a machine is making decisions that are gonna be sensitive, uh, that might be uh, really making a decision on a human, there is a, a trade-off that we can make uh, on the type of machines we use. So we'll have to decide whether we want a super highly performing uh, machine that's using techniques maybe like deep learning that's a lot less explainable or maybe a slightly less performant machine, but that can be really explained. So we understand how the decision was made. And then you can, as an organization, much more easily explain why were you approved or declined it had nothing to do with your gender uh, so if statistically it turns out that more women were declined because in fact um, they also were driving a car from 2010 like I mean, but it might have been a completely different reason but the outcome made it feel unfair and we've worked with clients on on changing some of those models to use techniques that were more explainable so that yeah if you're one of the uh, agents at the call center getting a client asking like why did i get declined my husband didn't it's not fair etc you can have a, a proper answer to again not lose the um the reputation of your organization because of math right in the end it is math ron any uh, thoughts on that yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. One is, um, you know, I think I think it's uh, easy to to still uh, have challenges even in an interpretable or, or, or explainable model, right? In the sense of, uh, you know, when when illegal redlining was being done in the U.S. and credit scores you know, there was no formal variable re that referred to race. Instead, you know, there were variables that correlated with race. So it, it presented as this is a fair, neutral way of deciding. But in fact, it was racist, right? So, uh, so simply because you can explain it doesn't actually mean that it's fair, right? Um, I, I, think, I think, you know, the ideal is really more of a justifiable model, which means you can justify it and say that it's actually, um, you know, comports with with your your ethics, your values, right? You can show that it 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 meets the standard, right? So absolutely, people like to be able to explain machine learning models, but you know, I think I think there's also a, a fair counterpoint, which is uh, uh, paraphrasing. Uh, our, our chief scientific advisor, uh, Dr. Jeff Hinton, uh, talking about, you know, would you rather have a robotic surgeon that, that is 10% more likely to save your life, but you can't explain what it does, or one that's fully explainable, but 10% less, less likely to save your life? I think most of us would pick uh, the one that's, that's better, right? Um, and, and the way you justify, you know, medical devices is through <laughs> randomized control trials and careful uh, proof of of quality more so than trying to deconstruct their state, right? Uh, so I think justifiability is more complicated, right? Because uh, it, it appeals to what are the things that are really good principles? What are the things that you really can, can accept as an argument to show that something is is working well? But you know, there, there's lots of things that can be uh, a bad about a decision, right? Like um, it's it, group fairness is one, right? Where you have uh, 
you know, from various different metrics of fairness, what, what are they, uh, are, are you treating people fairly, like giving people equal opportunity, for example. Um, but then there's also things like just noise, right? Like it's, it may be group fair if you've got a very noisy decision process. Um, you know, classic example, uh, I think referenced in uh, Kahneman's book uh, recently was um, talking about uh, judges where when they, uh, uh, when judges uh, come back from lunch, they're more likely to grant parole. And just before lunch, they're much less likely to grant parole. Well, they, you know, that's not biased against any one ethnic group, but it's very unfair to the people who have the wrong timing that they're less likely to be given parole, right? So noise uh, comes in, which I guess the last thing I'd say around this topic of bias is, you know, that there's a lot of factors that go in, right? We, we feed in historical data from a human context that's always got uh, its own limitations, gaps, and bias, right? We, we, we train in algorithms with different goals. You know, hopefully we're doing things to mitigate it, but then in the end, it's also being deployed in a context that has feedback loops, right? So, so I don't, the other thing I'd say though is you can't, you can't hold it up to a standard of perfection. There is no perfection in human affairs, right? We have to say, is it, is it justifiable? Is it, is it better than what we had before? Uh, you know, there's a good uh, op-ed uh, a couple years ago uh, entitled, uh, it's easier to fix biased algorithms than biased people. And I think it's true, right? That there's tremendous it is. to be better with algorithms if we were conscious and thoughtful. Yeah, and, and you can't remove bias unlike what people mentioned. I'm just gonna jump in because we, there was a question from, from the crowd on how do you use, uh, or how do you, you know, decide which, what's fair, because there's different definitions of fairness. So I liked what you, you mentioned, Ron, is like, for us, for example, we usually test for about 11 different definitions of fairness, we're working with clients, and then we let the, uh, the organization and the executives choose what they are going to be able to justify, as you've been touching, right? Like, so, uh, and that's why we, we touched on context and understanding what are the biases that are uh, still remaining like you may be biased to an individual if you're fair to the group uh, but as long as everybody's understanding what were well, how the machine's functioning and what was selected uh, I think it's justifiable and um, it will be more fair I'm willing to say it will be probably more fair than a human would be because of some of the additional factors that you mentioned Rod. We, we we there's no Friday afternoon for for a machine right it's acting the same way uh independent of what happened to them yesterday or uh what time of the day it is right so and that's what makes AI so attractive right is that uh, it's efficiency it's um uh, productivity but all those things matter to management and to leadership and organizations. And I would argue that much of the conversation that we're having right now starts with leadership and organizations. What would you say to the leaders in the, in the discussion today about how should they be approaching this? Where should they be starting? So where should they be starting? Well, education is, is a great place to start. Um, you know, understanding again what's going on how am i using the technology learning a little bit more about the technology you don't need to be a data scientist to to understand um, important concepts um, start also incorporating some of these control points in the processes of your organization around that technology and, and it's really should become a a um a citizen led to a certain extent um, understanding and effort, right? Like it's not this select group of people that know and understand AI uh, in a very, very deep manner and nobody else in the organization understands anything about it. I think it's, there's gonna be different levels of understanding, uh, but the more people grasp good and important concepts of AI, what it's meant to do and how it can be so beneficial when, when used uh, in, in the proper way, uh, the better off I think all the, the everyone will be, and it's it's fun. So hopefully everybody gets uh, some some uh, you know good energy coming from that education. I know for us we we really try to do that um, at PwC where it's everybody, even all our accountants, get some some learnings uh, and understanding, and slowly we're moving them up the scale on that that knowledge. Uh, but we really feel that's. The, the, um, the safest and better way to, um, to safeguard again uh, and become more responsible with the use of AI. Go ahead, Ron. 
Yeah, I, I certainly, I think that, that that's a, definitely an important direction, right? Obviously we're passionate about education and, and integrating, you know, both educating the organization on AI and on responsible AI and ethics along with it. Uh, I think complementing that is, uh, you know, some, some articulation of, of values and governance uh, that starts from the top, right? That ultimately, uh, you know, as Anne was talking about earlier, right? It's, it's not enough to just hope the technical teams will do the right thing, right? It's like setting out like, what are the values that you're gonna pursue? And of course there's lots of, of templates or approaches, right? You know, OACD has published them. There's lots of, of proposed ones. I think organizations have to adapt and think about how it fits into their context and their value system. But then a governance mechanism of like, how do you decide on and, and both upfront and then ongoing for projects? Um, what I would encourage organizations to do, um, like we recently responded to uh, the province of Ontario's trustworthy AI guidelines uh, from the Vector Institute and Schwartz Reisman Institute. And we said, we suggested, you know, starting with areas where there was, uh, you know, piloting in areas where there was the most risk and saying like, start here rather than try to cover everything and learn, you know, you should pilot this and pick some areas where you really want, need to, to put a focus and get it right. And then say, how can you dial it in and start to learn as an organization, right? Pull together a cross-functional team and really learn about how do you assess that risk up front and then how do you do ongoing monitoring? Um, in the case of, you know, a recommendation of the government of Ontario is about also how do you start to foster an ecosystem of private companies that can help organizations with this. But in any organization, I think piloting is incredibly important. So having that top-down sponsorship, as well as the bottoms-up education, I think is important. So Annie, yeah, Annie, I was just going to call on you on the subject of governance. I think you, you've got a lot of experience there. What would you share? Yeah, so so that's... Um, it, it, I like the what you mentioned around like it goes top down and bottom up. So there is definitely uh, we're seeing lots of work being done on shaping some policies and some uh, internal trend organizations and really coming up with best practices and guidelines when it comes to the use of AI. So that's really important and it is meant to be that kind of guiding light for everybody else. Uh, so that's one area where we're seeing some some movement and um again it, it we're seeing the the ripple effect of those being put in place the other types that we're seeing is also from under the way that we're developing and testing uh the term that you may have heard out in the market is ml ops so understanding that it's not typical software engineering so we're not talking about DevOps, but we're really moving towards another type of, of uh, execution, which is MLOps. And within those practices, there are uh, additional points of again, controls and governance that are put in place to make sure that we're, um, again, testing, understanding, shaping this machine with the right construct in mind. Um, so can it be agile? Absolutely. But it is being developed in a very different way. And really what we're doing is training a mathematical model by exposing it to loads of data. It's different than building a software engineering machine, right? So, so it needs to have, um, again, different approaches, different testing and different process throughout. So that's another area that we're, we're seeing a lot um, where, again, I think there's some gaps is, is more on the, uh, the follow on and the support of that um, of that model, that governance for ongoing machines, it's hit and miss. Some organizations have it. Is it thoroughly maintained and thoroughly done? I'm not sure yet. It might be due, and we touched on this much earlier in the conversation around um, you know standards of AI. There are none really because it's a technology that's been moving so fast. We kind of know what's risky and important and what we want to check for, but there are no um, you know this is the standard ISO 101 <laughs> that you need to, to meet to be able to, um, to have your machine basically be safe for usage. So it's, um, it's particularly important, but also particularly difficult sometimes to, to govern and manage these, these machines because there are um, no you know, 
clear standards that we're trying to uh, to test for um, once it's being used. Thanks, Annie. So, Ron, you mentioned that um, uh, the government of Ontario um, did uh, intervene with some guidelines there. There's a question in the chat around what is the role of government when it comes to accountability? So uh, I love what you said about um, do we leave it to the engineers to do the right thing? Um, maybe comment on the role of government. Yeah, certainly. Well, I think I think it's it's an area where uh, absolutely government should have a role, right? And, uh, you know, there is some, some is around promoting standards, right? So there is work in developing standards and, you know, uh, the Canadian government, you know, is continuing to support, uh, you know, standards development in AI, um, you know, the, the IEEE, ISO standards, OECD, um, also sponsors the global partnership on AI, right? So there's, there's a lot of work on, on discussing standards. I think there's also role, um, like, like in the example of the Ontario government of saying, hey, start with showing good practices in deploying AI in the public sector and, you know, set standards for how that will be done. And, you know, that can also create a virtuous cycle of creating, uh, you know, technology and in innovation and approach. But I also think it, it needs to land in a, in a thoughtful way uh, across private sector, right? So I'm, I think, the, the idea, you know, the, the EU has done a lot, obviously notable that they've got draft legislation regulating AI. I think some aspects of that are, are important and thoughtful. Um, I think their, uh, their idea though of, of having upfront assessment of what are risky areas by big domains is, is really misguided, right? It's still such early innings of AI to try to say, you know, these are the domains where high risk will, will be defined. Um, it, it, you know, nobody knows, right? And, and it's also the, such broad brushstroke that uh, you, you can end up with high risk areas like, you know, the, around, uh, around uh, law enforcement. Okay, so, you know, face recognition in policing, you know, clearly is, is a high, high risk area where you wanna be very careful to make sure uh, if you're gonna do it at all that you've got the right controls, don't have bias, have the right accuracy. But then, you know, other areas like planning uh, the, the investment of resources, you know, around, you know, scheduling or operationalizing is in a police department, much lower risk, right? And so putting a whole sector like that and saying it's high risk, uh, you know, creates a lot of, of challenge, right? So I think, I think again, uh, you know, and it, it, instead of having, upfront broad brushstroke, we really, I really believe you, you want to start with a more narrow definition of, you know, what is, what is risky, but then a learning approach of like, as society advances, as we see things coming up, how do we adapt? How do we start to put, you know, the right controls in place? And, you know, it would, it's valuable to have a structure where broad standards are set, uh, by government, but then there's private sector innovation instead of trying to rely on government regulators to keep up and write very specific rules and regulations in a, such a fast moving space, right? So I guess th those are my quick thoughts uh, on, on it. Uh, we could talk a lot longer about the role of government and how it can foster responsible AI while promoting innovation. It, it's an important topic. Annie, your thoughts? So, well, there's definitely been a lot of investments. We've heard about the, the super clusters trying to, again, promote that innovation. And then there's uh, also been some investments in the AI strategy for the government, which was just renewed, I think, recently. Uh, it started about in, in 2017 with a $125 million investment. So there's some investments. Where and how should they, they play? I think it is that combination of we need to promote innovation. I think we all think, and I think in this group that AI can do more good than, than bad, but also now invest in helping organizations understand the guardrails that they need to put up, um, you know, help understand again, what, uh, what are the, the, the situations that are higher risk? And I agree with Ron, it's not per sector, it's more about what is the machine being used for um, 
and it doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means you need to put, again, additional guardrails, certain things that you need to put in place to make sure it, it becomes and stays a positive thing um, in that process and in that sector. So um, two, twofold is basically, and I, I do think they're investing on both sides. We haven't had um, concrete laws come out uh, just yet, but if we're looking across the globe, there's definitely some movement, especially in Europe. Uh, there's been a lot on the data side with JDPR, but there's also now more and more um, regulations coming out from an AI perspective. Also in the US, there's been some um, either locally, like we've seen uh, in New York, you cannot hire somebody using an, an AI machine without specific you know, situations being guarded. So that's pointed to hiring, using a machine to hire in New York City. So we're being a lot more pointed and you can put a regulation around that. So I think these are the things that we can expect um, and that are gonna help, uh, you know, to make organizations feel, feel safer in, in going forward, using this, following these guardrails, making sure that we're doing the right things to, um, to again, use AI for good and not uh, put ourselves at risk. Right. So you're both uh, practitioners. You're in the industry, as Ron said, uh, um, you know, we're in it and we've talked about different stakeholders, government leaders, etc. But we're also citizens, right? We're also users, uh, end users of these technologies. Uh, Ron, maybe I'll start with you um, as a user and a citizen. What would you say to other users and citizens who uh, were using the technologies right now? Maybe there's resistance, maybe there isn't. Um, what's your perspective of community and people? How should we be thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that it, it's really transforming uh, society that that these capabilities uh, are creating a, a lot of change and a lot of good change, a lot of innovation, but also a, a lot of disruptive change, right? I mean, I think one of the things that that I would most like to see is I would like to see uh, you know healthy competition where you know different organizations can uh, can can really compete to better serve customers with AI technologies, right? Where, where I think we run into trouble is when uh, you end up with uh, a lack of choice and you kind of get dictated to uh, the, the public, what are the, the trade-offs you're gonna make in terms of privacy or the way you're gonna be treated. And, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think a big part of it, you know, ought to be uh, what the Electronic Freedom uh, Foundation calls, you know, adversarial interoperability, right? How do we allow for, you know, new services to come and bring AI and better serve us than the incumbents, right? So I think AI can do so much good in that context, but that's, uh, as a citizen, that's the thing that most worries me is uh, increasingly like, um, instead of the future that I thought we would have, where we would have a personal AI agent that we own and control, we've got, you know, something listening to us in our kitchen from a handful of big tech companies that makes money based on them selling ads to us. And, and that's not the future that I, I would have hoped for. Okay, Annie, as a citizen and user and participant in the world, what are you thinking? Yes, similar to Ron, like I, I like to think people are fundamentally good, but <laughs> that's a little naive, clearly. So the it is a powerful technology um, when not used in the intent that, you know, that matches organizations' values, it can become very, very dangerous. And and that's why we keep touching back on that governance, like having an organization be accountable for what this machine is doing and why it's doing it and aligning that with their values, saying like, you approve this, that means you are okay with manipulating your customers. And that's the clear choice that you made as an organization. Starting to expose some of that more, more um, obviously, I think uh, I would feel a lot better as, as a citizen. Um, I will say what is exciting and the part that didn't let me down from a, from a citizen though is the, uh, from a techie, is the community, right? There's, it started off as being a very, open source, let's share, let's learn, let's let's grow together. There's pockets of people that are sharing less, but it's remained a fairly open and collaborative community when it comes to innovation and and 
trying to use again AI for good and make it more uh, and make it a better uh, technology with the the good being the purpose. So there's a lot of that still happening as well. So that's the part I'm, I am happy about, but I am concerned uh, about the um, lack of transparency or the lack of accountability for those who are using the technology in, in what I consider an, a negative way. So as we're wrapping up, um, Annie, I think you just want, answered one of the questions that came up, which was uh, how are companies balancing good with harm? Um, and certainly, you know, the governance is the, the strongest weapon we have. To bad things happen with AI. So Ron, you sort of alluded to the kind of future that you're looking towards in AI. What are some of the use cases or some of the, the, the exciting things you're excited about in AI in the future? Ron, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, you know, I think there's uh, there's a, a ton of innovation continuing to happen with the, the, the great research uh, in fundamental advances in deep learning and related disciplines. You know, I think that that's um, that and, you know, more open source contributions of, of great tools and techniques uh, are really democratizing access, right? So we're seeing AI being used you know, in, in hospitals, you know, not just in clinical scenarios, but also to drive operational efficiency that, that you know, saves money that can be used to, to instead provide better care, right? And we're seeing it being used to address climate change, right? And to, to provide better answers, you know, better materials, as well as better understanding of climate change problems, right? And we're seeing it being used uh, to, you know, to continue to delight uh, customers and provide better experiences in, in a range of industries, right? We're seeing uh, a lot of opportunities around uh, you know, better customer service, right? That both improves the quality uh, experience so that uh, customers can get better results, but also companies can be more efficient in doing so um, and eliminating a lot of drudgery. So people uh, in their work can focus on the creative, uh, thoughtful aspects of the work and, and less on the you know, the slog of doing things that are, are mundane and routine, right? So there's, there's a ton of great startups uh, in the, uh, the Toronto ecosystem and broader that are applying AI to all kinds of great things, as well as, you know, lots of great advances, uh, you know, in, in larger companies applying the technologies as well. So those are just a few, obviously. Uh, we could talk at, at length about all the great things that, that, you know, are happening with the use of AI, you know, in the vector, vector ecosystem and more broadly. Annie? Yeah, no, so I, I echo everything you said, Ron, and just a top of double click on a couple of them um, around, you know, making this a uh, more enjoyable situation for, from an employee perspective. So there's a lot of mundane things, as Ron mentioned, that, you know, rare are the humans that can get excited about data entry and, and things like that and, and or just some basic, you know, analysis of large scopes of data, uh, you know, to have that help working hand in hand with machines that can take care of the less fun part of your, our work and work more on the exciting, more analysis driven, client facing type of activities, I think is, is super exciting and amazing to see. And the other thing it helps is, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of shortage uh, in, in people available to work, especially in Canada uh, for, for certain types of work. And I would say, generally in the market, we could use uh, more people available. So to have, again, that opportunity to um, collaborate between human and machine and make sure we're uh, giving and, and continuing to improve the services we have for our customers with potentially a, 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 a different team and skill sets that's now shared with other machines because we don't necessarily um, um, have the uh, the ability to hire new people that's also been interesting for me the other one and you touch on the environmental impact so for me using ai to address esg concerns so environmental societal and, and the governance is a huge opportunity i think we're we are really in trouble right now when it comes to environment to use this as um, a positive influence is definitely something that um, 
I have close to my heart and I'm super excited to, to see how we can help. There are some research though on, you know, the more powerful the AI machines, the more energy it consumes as well. So also reducing the footprint of AI itself is important. I, in Canada, we talk about a little less, a bit less because we have renewable energy, but, uh, you know, it's two front, but using AI in a reduced um, environmental impact capacity to help is is something that I uh, am really excited about. I can't wait to see well, how we can apply it. Ron, you've actually uh, done some work uh, talking about sustainability. Do you want to just drop a comment on that uh, subject? Yeah, you know, certainly we uh, we we both to, to Annie's point, you know, we we track and give feedback to the, the uh, researchers using our uh, resources at Vector. You know, what is the the climate impact, and you know, we're we're uh, investing to offset you know that so that we uh, we can uh, get get to carbon neutrality. You know, is, is direction we're committed to. But I, I do think that there is tremendous opportunity, right? That we have uh, researchers in the vector community who are doing great work in this area more broadly, right? So I do think that uh, you know using machine learning and data to really uh, in all kinds of areas, right? There's so much work to do as a society uh, to to reduce uh, the carbon footprint that we have. That you know machine learning has a, a ton to offer, and you know very much excited about how we can make a positive contribution um, in, in, with this field, uh, which, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And it is true, Annie's point, that uh, we are blessed in Canada with lots of hydroelectric power that is naturally green. So the electricity we use has a lower carbon footprint than in, in, in many places. All right. So as we as we round out uh, the subject, um, just one uh, note in the uh, questions there around the complexity of black box models and um, balancing that with mitigation and transparency. Annie, do you want to quickly take that one uh, as we close out? Yeah. So so absolutely. So that's a, a debate that we have with with. Even within PwC, we have sometimes the options of buying a product that's very black box. Um, and depending on the the purpose of the model, we may have different decisions. Like we had to consider one for hiring, for example. Uh, but for us, it, it's too important that we understand the 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 biases that are incorporated in it and how it was trained and what are the, um, the what I needed transparency to be able to really use that model. So for that, you know, and you can go back to an organization and say, look, for me to buy your product, I need to see the code and I want to do my own, run my own tests on it. And I'll tell you if it fits with my values and my, my, um, my purpose. Uh, some will say yes, uh, they'll make you sign some NDAs, of course, etc. But don't think that because it's considered black box, you can't ask the question and ask to test it. If the answer is no, and I don't have the ability to test it in a situation that I consider um, sensitive, as an organization, I'm just gonna step away from that. Um, this being said, if it's a machine that's helping me, you know, you know, process, you know, invoices at a faster pace, uh, I'm gonna be a lot more comfortable with with a black box situation with is I'm more focused on performance than on um, on fairness right in this case it's more how fast can you process my invoices <laughs> I'm good with that so it depends again on context but you can certainly ask the question and nobody uh, can force you to incorporate a black box AI in your organization you know just as a very quick add-on to those great points that Annie made yeah I, I would even be thinking in addition to explaining is also how do I control or override? You know, if I have this black box model and something goes wrong, what will I do, right? How will I address that, right? So that has to be part of our thinking too. Yeah, and that uh, brings us to uh, a closing the session with a very important point that's around that collaboration between research and industry. Um, and as you know, this uh, conversation was brought to you by Vector Institute and PwC. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, our uh, speakers today to just uh, give us some closing remarks and uh, uh, let us know uh, what should we be thinking about after the session. So, um, Ron, may I start with you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we very much are actively engaged in projects with 
uh, our industry sponsors at Vector, you know, and, and our researchers on topics like uh, uh, privacy, enhancing technologies for machine learning, you know, such as federated learning and differential privacy, where we're doing a collaboration project uh, coming up in the fall and trustworthy AI, you know, so techniques along the lines we've talked about today, as well as accelerating AI. So responsible ways to allow innovation while still preserving uh, privacy and, and protecting other values, right? So it's become high on the agenda, these collaborations for how do you unlock value um, in a responsible way, right? And I think it's one of the, the strengths of having great research and close partnerships in private sector that we can really learn from each other in advance in a practical way. Thank you, Annie. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, I think that's a great closing point. So that collaboration, it will bring different perspectives. As much as it's important to have diversity on a team that's developing a model, having diversity in the types of organizations, whether it's acad academia, government, uh, organizations that are, uh, you know, that are from the financial sector. So having that variety of perspective is going to, you know, bring that richness and make sure that we are uh, addressing and, and moving that uh, the topic in a, in a, a responsible but um, certainly concrete and actionable manner <laughs> as well. So it doesn't say too academic, <laughs> but the academia can bring the, the ideas and, and really test drive some of the things that the, the group might be thinking. So uh, really, really um, like those collaborations. Fantastic. So that's it, folks. That's the perfect note to end on. Diversity as a risk mitigation strategy and an opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for attending our session today brought to you by Vector Institute and PwC. You've got some contact information on your screen of how to get a hold of us if you'd like to talk more about this topic or other topics. Um, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for joining us and have a fantastic rest of your day. <laughs>